Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the sixth installment of the CX Energy Virtual Experience. These webinars are presented by the AABC Commissioning Group, as well as its sister organizations, the Associated Air Balance Council and the Energy Management Association. I'm Sam Schwartz, and I'm a Member Engagement and Marketing Manager for ACG, AABC, and EMA. Since we are unable to meet in person this year, we're hoping to bring you as much of the commissioning, energy management, and testing-related education as we can through a combination of live webinars like this one, as well as some additional pre-recorded sessions. I do just have a few quick notes before we get started. I encourage you to submit questions at any time using the questions tab on the left-hand side of your screen. But while doing so, please make sure to submit questions to the questions box and not the general chat box. A few will be selected to answer at the end of the webinar, time permitting, and the speaker will answer the rest via email afterward. Also on the left-hand side of your screen, you will see the resources tab where you can download a PDF of today's slides. There is also a notes tab on the right-hand side of your screen where you can make notes on today's webinar, and those will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. If you happen to be experiencing any technical issues during the webinar, please click on the request support button on the lower left side of the player. Finally, in terms of continuing education credit, you will receive an email after the webinar with instructions on how to get your proof of attendance. We're going to be asking you to check into these sessions through the CX Energy app to automate that process. Continuing the virtual experience today is multi-phase commissioning on an international airport in Aruba with your speaker, Kelly DJ of Bauman Consulting. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And with that, I'll hand it off to you, Kelly. Thank you very, very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who has joined this webinar today. I wanted to start by wishing everybody and their families good health, perseverance as we go through these hard times during the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you're all staying safe, maintaining social distancing while working from home for those who can. This 50 minute potentially maximum uh, webinar is an attempt at providing a simplification of the commissioning services BAM Consulting is providing for an international airport on the island of Aruba. BAM Consulting is a consulting firm with a transatlantic footprint in the USA, Washington DC and Chicago, and also in Frankfurt, Germany. We provide commissioning services, building performance modeling, master plan energy consulting services, as well as sustainability certification services. I wanted to quickly start with some basic information about me. I'm a senior mechanical engineer. Over 16 years of my career, I've been involved in design and commissioning of large and small scale projects in Europe, United Kingdom, where I started my career, um, Switzerland, Germany, the Middle East, North Africa, the Caribbean, and also within the United States, where I currently reside in Chicago. I attained my chartered engineer status about 11 years ago, which is the equivalent of a PE here in the US. And I'm also qualified as a lead AP and have um, ASHRAE Building Commissioning Professional Accreditations and Building Energy Assessment Professional Accreditations. I'm also on the board of the Illinois Board of Directors for the Illinois Green Alliance, which is a USGBC chapter here in the state of Illinois. So the project I want to focus on is the Queen Beatrix International Airport in Aruba, which is Aruba's gateway to serving more than two and a half million visitors annually with over 14 nonstop um, destinations in the US, I think about five and a half thousand flights per year. And there are 19 other direct international destinations, over 6,000 flights per year to more than over 14 countries. The airport is currently undergoing a major renovation. It's deemed the Gateway 2030 project, the first major expansion in 20 years to increase its current footprint by more than 50% to increase the number of airport gates and its retail, confectionery, beverage outlets, including administrative capacity. The facility will be seeking LEED Gold certification. The project also targeted the upgrade of the existing facility MEP systems there's going to be a new facility energy or utility center. There's going to be a computerized baggage handling system and a procurement of a building automation system or building management system for the entire facility. This is a first. Bama Consulting were basically hired by Aruba Airports to manage the third party commissioning process across the expansion and the existing facility, the BMS integration, et cetera. We're using a commissioning, a web-based um, commissioning platform to manage communication with all stakeholders, including coordinating with facilities management and operations to manage the assets after construction. Um, the following slides will gloss over the different aspects or phases of, the, of this very complex project, from the gateway expansion, to the upgrades, to the, to the MEP systems, to the new facility energy center, and the BMS implementation. 
and also to go over how Bauman is currently using a web-based commissioning tool to manage the third-party commissioning process interaction with the international design team and construction phase teams. I will also show some of our commissioning checklists that were created and coordinated for the different project phases. And I'll conclude this webinar with how we are currently in communication with the facilities management to transfer some of the equipment information and features directly to their computerized maintenance management system or CMMS. Uh, quick fun facts and figures about the island of Aruba. So it forms part of the kingdom of the Netherlands. It's in the Southern Caribbean Sea in a region called the Dutch Antilles or the ABC Islands. It's called ABC because it includes Curaçao and Bonaire. So if you put Aruba in there, that's ABC Islands. It lies outside of the Hurricane Alley, so it's kind of lucky, and it's about 30 miles north of Venezuela. It's about three hours south of Miami by air, so anyone who wants to travel there, it's just three hours from Miami. It has a population of about 112,000 permanent inhabitants from over 90 different nationalities and ethnic groups, and it's in approximately 70 square miles. It welcomes about 2 million plus visitors per year. Uh, quick. Timeline about the airport. First ac aircraft landing was about 100 years ago when it began to have bi-weekly KLM flights between it and Curaçao, its neighboring island. It was then used as a U.S. Air Force base back in the Second World War, where it was called the Dakota Airport. It was renamed Queen Beatrix after the Netherlands sovereign, Her Royal Highness Queen Juliana in the 60s, during the start of the jet age, and started having Pan Am flights direct to the U.S. It had its last major expansion, like I mentioned earlier, 20 years ago. All right, the rendering is an overview of the Aruba airport with the planned expansion and upgrades mentioned earlier, taken from the Caribbean Sea as you land. So if you're coming in, this is basically what you should see. Um, it's a great place to visit, I would highly recommend. So the gateway expansion, which is the main building in the picture, is approximately a $200 million investment and will have updated US pre-clearance facilities, a TSA compliant baggage handling system, three additional aircraft great gates to handle anticipated higher traffic of visitors an expanded and centralized um, check-in and immigration center, including increased retail food and beverage offerings. It has a 48 month project timeline and it started in early 2019 with an anticipated completion of 2023, 2024. This was pre-COVID, so there might be a few delays. The new and relocated facility center or energy center, it's a smaller building to the left of the picture with the right, um, with the red text. That's the creation of a new housing for existing and new chillers, cooling towers, medium and low voltage rooms, substations, constant current regulators, generator rooms, water treatment, etc. You name it, it's got it. It had a 12 month project timeline with an anticipated completion later on this month. So it's currently ongoing, final stages of um, testing and we'll go over that later. Um, the site acceptance and the site integration tests are currently ongoing like I mentioned and I actually attended a virtual site acceptance test just yesterday with a 7 a.m. start that lasted about four hours. The existing facility upgrades include the replacement of 23 to 27 air handling units, over 160 variable air volume boxes, a myriad of fan core units, energy meters and their associated controllers. This will be in stages and will be implemented whilst the airport is in operation. So we'll to have a 36 month project timeline in conjunction with the Gateway 2030 project, which is the expansion. And it has an anticipated completion of 2021. Um, now, next slide. Uh, the building management system upgrades in the picture on the right shows the current architecture of the BMS system. It will include monitoring and direct digital controls connection to the Gateway 2030 expansion, the facility energy center, the existing facility upgrade with close to 10,000 data points for the complete automation of the MEP systems. This will also be in stages and will be implemented whilst the airport is in operation. Something quickly about the BMS, it will implement what's known as a never fail redundancy system between two servers via VAN or LAN. It's basically an ethernet connection that's performed over a TX twisted pair network at about 100 Mbps. It will ensure that there is no loss of communication at any time due to unforeseen circumstances. As you would expect in an airport, this is pretty crucial. Um, just wanna talk real quickly about the team organigram which on, on the right, it shows the complexity of such a project with relationships and interfaces of some of the key design and construction partnerships. 
This is just an example from the Utility Energy Center building. This is just one part of the scope. From the top, Aruba Airport Authority is a client. We have a contract with them. They have a contracting team who act as a PM for the project in with um, Aruba Airport Authority. RHDHV is the Dutch MEP designer with NACO, their airport subdivision. Integ is the BMS contractor hired directly by AAA. Hill International is the engineer on site. Alas Nadem Renaissance from the Netherlands and Turkey is a general contractor with a myriad of subcontractors, some local from, from outside of Aruba. Baum Consultant is a third party commissioning provider interacting and interfacing with all parties on behalf of Aruba Airport Authority. I just put a rendering overview here of the airport with the plan expansion and upgrades mentioned earlier, looking towards the Caribbean Sea. You would also notice solar panels over the parking area. The intention is for the completed expansion and additional systems to have the same net energy consumption before the expansion when the PV energy generation is included in the calculation. That way there is no significant additional demand on the island's utility provider for electricity. Next slide. All right, for the Gateway 2030 expansion, which will certify um, on the lead, we basically implemented an ASHRAE commissioning steps listed on the left of this slide, from the owner project requirements, to the basis of design reviews, to the creation of a commissioning plan and specifications. We've also performed periodic design reviews for the MEP systems during the design phase, which concluded in the summer of 2019. The slide shows a commissioning platform dashboard snapshot at the time the screenshot was taken, where we identified and coordinated the resolution of design elements from a commissioning perspective with AAA in Aruba, RHDHV in Narco in Netherlands, Bauman Consulting in Chicago, with a series of in-person and virtual meetings. So I guess we were doing virtual meetings before COVID-19, which is great. We shared the commissioning platform and collaboratively, collaboratively reviewed all aspects of the 27 plus air units, eight pumps, multiple terminal units, lighting controls, electrical equipment, and provisions such as panel boards, switchboards, et cetera, including the facilities management training plan. For the owner project requirements review, we reviewed the documentation in the first picture. It's the Gateway 2030 project business case from AAA for the owner and the user requirements. It also had environmental and sustainability goals, energy efficiency goals, indoor air quality requirements, et cetera, including any building occupant and operation maintenance requirements. We created a checklist on the right to document where this information was located within the document, including identify and discuss any gaps by creating an issues log to ensure that these were addressed and included in future updates to the document. For the basis of design review, we reviewed the document in the first picture. It's the Gateway 2030 design brief for primary design assumptions, design standards that were utilized, MEP narrative descriptions for HVAC, electric lighting controls, domestic water, building envelope, et cetera. We created a checklist to the right of the document. And so any deficiencies were identified by creating an issues log to track what was included or what was lacking, for instance, and to suggest where more information was required. An example, for example, is the redundancy electric power requirements, which had to be revised to the satisfaction of AAA based on their operational needs. Okay. So we created a commissioning plan, as the picture on the right, to address the roles and responsibilities of all parties in, involved in the project process. This included the, pro the project program overview and commissioning schedule, the commissioning team, the commissioning activities during pre-design, design, construction, occupancy, and warranty phases, the entire mirror of the project. This was included as part of the bid package, along with specific trade subdivision specifications. The commissioning action plan sent a picture is basically was created on the CX platform to provide a snapshot in real time for all parties to understand where the project was as regards to commissioning task, including what was scheduled to come. Okay, right, next slide. We also perform periodic design reviews with the mechanical design documentation, which is the center picture, to ascertain the overall quality of the design and log any discrepancies with the OPR, BOD, owner project requirements, basis of design, check for any updated equipment lists, sequence of operations, SOOs, testing and balancing requirements, tab, set points for temperatures, volumetric flow rates, including any specified tolerances, you know, plus or minus one degree or plus or minus. Um, certain maybe um, relative humidity requirement. Any discrepancies were logged on the CX web-based platform, which is document to the right, and these were addressed during in-person and virtual meetings. 
We also performed periodic design reviews on the electrical design documentation, center picture, to ascertain the overall quality of the design. Any login with discrepancies to the OPI or the BOD, checking for any updated equipment list as usual, um, testing and maintenance access, power capacities, calculations, including any specified redundancy requirements. Any, that, any discrepancies were logged on the platform as well and addressed during the in-person and um, virtual meetings as well. Um, just we talked a little bit about um, the commissioning specifications. We also created for the bid package the following commissioning specifications. We had a general commissioning requirements. We had HVAC. We had plumbing. We had fire suppression. We had electric lighting and power systems. Okay, and we're just taking a quick pause here to show a rendering of one of the new gates being proposed for this project. I just thought I'd share that with you guys. Okay, for the utility energy center building, we implemented the same ASHRAE commissioning steps listed on the left-hand side of this slide. Owner project requirements, basis of design, creation of commissioning plans and specifications, design reviews for the MAP systems. This project should be concluded at this time. And after, basically, we, like I mentioned originally, we had a site, into, site acceptance test yesterday, and we are having virtual meetings basically over the course of this week and next week as we go through all the different steps. Um, it's a very, very involved process, and we're very happy to be participating despite COVID-19. I should have been on the island at this time. It's a shame, but we can do what we can from here. Focusing on commissioning plan for a second, the following photos show on a coordination meeting, a, a, co a typical coordination meeting that was held in a project site last year with all stakeholders. So in the pictures there, you have the client, you have the owner, you have the owner project team, you have the general contractor, you have the controls contractor, you have the subs, you have different suppliers, it's an island, so you have a lot of supplies coming in. You have the utility power providers making sure that we adhere to their requirements. And you had to take two separate photos to try and get everyone in the shot. Working on a large scale project like this, especially with international projects, requires uh, a, lot, a high degree of respect and appreciation for all viewpoints. Not one person can perform all tasks by themselves, and there's loads that we can learn from each other, definitely. So it's a great team to work with and we're absolutely enjoying working together, even though we are from very diverse backgrounds and diverse um, kind of attitudes to work. Okay, for this scope, we provided the following pre-functional checklist for the MEP systems within the scope. These include like things like model verifications, physical condition checks, installation procedures, method statements for each equipment, chillers, cooling towers, associated pumps, et cetera. The two photos on the right is an example of a pre-functional checklist created on a commissioning platform for chiller number five, and which is one of the new chillers, and cooling tower number three, which is one of the existing cooling towers. We also performed submittal reviews and site observation walkthrough reports during early, mid, and in the final stages of installation. I'm going to show a series of photos to show the construction of the energy center with the necessary scaffolding, pre-assembly, cooling towers, new and existing, et cetera. On the other slide here, we have more of the same with regards to photos from site observation re reports. A lot of these pictures were provided by the contractor, which I really appreciate. It basically shows the six chillers located below the seven cooling towers in the previous picture that I actually showed. And it shows associated pumps. Um, it shows um, things like um, um, UPS systems. It also shows, um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to just retract real quickly. The chillers that we actually have there are actually about 295 tons each, which is quite a bit of a capacity though. We're also showing in some of these pictures here, we have the uninterruptible power supply systems, the electrical splice works, the constant current regulators to ensure power stability of the facility, including the airfield ground lighting and also the backup 950 KVA generators. As an island, sometimes they have intermittent um, power failures. And so we need to make sure that we have uh, a system that actually can take all of those on board. And here are some of the pictures of the generators. Here are some of the pictures of the UPS system. And here's the control panels for the equipment. From yesterday's site acceptance test, the current test plan for the test to complete was discussed, as well as the scheduling of this test. The integration and coordination with the BMS contractor elements, as well as other aspects, were also covered 
including equipment sequencing. Um, like I mentioned, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, I was not able to be there in person, but the BMS provider from Panama, including the MEP engineer from the Netherlands and myself from our Chicago location, were able to observe remotely and review the BMS responses by way of confirmation and verification for the commissioning steps. It was also great that they were able to supply these really nice pictures that we could use to verify. So we also reviewed the BMS trend data equipment. I mean, the BMS trend data for the equipment is a process called operation diagnostics, where we observe the operational patterns from the trends to verify equipment, sequence of operation, and also performance. Okay. Okay, this is a picture of the chiller and the cooling tower primary loop schematic, as well as the associated pumps. So the chillers are at the bottom, the cooling towers on the top, and all the different connections are included in that picture. This was utilized to verify functionality and performance of the entire chilled water and condenser water systems in real time. So um, the technician makes a change. We can see temperatures and volumes change and equipment come online and offline as directed. This is a bit of a close up of chillers five and six, which are the new chillers that would actually handle the base load. They're the um, lead chillers. The other chillers which are existing, so chillers one, two, three, and four, were relocated to the energy center and they were connected to this loop. They were connected to this loop and they will serve the additional capacity as lag chillers. So we use the screenshot, which I just shared here to verify equipment statuses, um, flow and return temperatures, valve positions, primary and bypass flows, et cetera. Um, all of this in real time, just to check functionality of the, of the systems as they come online, offline, um, they get staged, they ramp up, um, one goes offline in a simulated kind of way. So we see the other chillers kind of take up that additional load and continue to um, move forward with the progression. So that's uh, quite a really great project and really great interaction that we're able to have all this documentation sent to us so that we can see. Slide 31 real quickly. All right, in real time, as well as checking on the BMS communications, there's the communications link from the control panels to the BMS interface was also verified using the checklist, which is a picture on the left. And on the right were the ICT connection points in real time, making sure that what you have on the left actually matches with what you have on the right. And sometimes the best way to do it is to do that by hand and to have it really next to each other so that you can ensure that there are no issues with connectivity later on and making sure that the right connection points are actually um, kind of linking or communicating with each other. All right, a quick pause here. So we're just going to talk real quickly now about the existing facility upgrades, the HVC and the controls commissioning aspect of this particular project. So this is a rendering of the planned airport upgrade. Um, it's not a great picture because I have something overlaid but it's basically showing what the interior of the um, airport will look like once this is basically going through um, customs and exercise, et cetera. All right. For the planned facility upgrades, as mentioned earlier, we have between also 23 to 27 air handling units, including over 160 VAV or variable air volume boxes and other terminal units within the scope. The commissioning process for this also follows the ASHRAE requirements, OPL, BOD, CX plan, communicated already earlier between all stakeholders. The document center for the screen is the request, the document in center of the screen is a request for proposal for the procurement, the installation, and the controls for these air handling units. It, there's a, and the document on the right hand side of the screen is a list of all the different air handling unit attributes that we required, which involve everything from flow rates to supply and return temperatures to or a myriad of functionality and features that these AHUs are supposed to actually have. For this scope, we reviewed the design decisions and we created an issues log where we identified either discrepancies between the design or the discrepancies between the technical, submit, the technical submittals that were provided by the contractor and in some cases, a requirement for more information was actually um, requested because um, initially what we received, we were not very happy with. So we asked for a resubmittal and we were able to track all the issues that we identified, such as discrepancies with the OPR or discrepancies with the BOD, 
any equipment list updates that were not tracked, any inconsistent drawings or schedules, making sure that the sequence of operations were updated, making sure that set points and volumetric flow rates were included, whatever testing and balancing instructions were going to be required, and lockouts for heating and cooling, simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, for most of the systems here, it's cooling only, so that's not a big issue. But in some instances, we have additional heating, so we have to make sure that the heating and the cooling systems are not working um, simultaneously, which is kind of like huge in an energy standpoint. And we don't really want that. All right, so, uh, so discrepancies, we track these through the CX issues log. Um, the, we also have obviously kickoff meeting minutes, so how we um, kind of manage the um, commissioning meetings in real time. But for the discrepancies that we have to track, we have basically address these in pre-functional checklists, which we'll go into more detail in the next few, in the next few slides. All right, so we prepared actually for this particular project a very extensive pre-functional checklist for each individual air handling unit and variable air volume box. Um, as you can understand, um, the contractors there are not used to working with ASHRAE standards. They have the different standards which we have to kind of manage and manipulate to actually provide something that would be acceptable from an ASHRAE standpoint. So things like um, basically how we staged this were initially from manufacturer and model verifications making sure that the equipment that we're actually trying to do pre-functional is actually the right equipment. And there were also physical observations of the equipment upon receipt from transit, and which were, and also there were installation checklists that just going through line by line item, what needs to be done and who needs to check these out. The checklist was shared with the resident engineer on site and also the contractors. And between the resident engineer on site, the contractors and us, we in real time update these as and when different equipment is actually brought in, installed, and kind of connected into the whole process. So we also went through the different equipment components from fans and dampers and all different line items associated with those. The electric connections, um, in terms of power supply to those particular units, making sure the connections were sound and sturdy and could, you know, um, be in place for quite a long time and not have like big issues later on. We also checked connections to the variable frequency drives, things like dock installation, also things like controls, for instance, were all included in the checklist. So you can see in that checklist, we have the green ticks, which means um, activities have been completed. We have an X or a not applicable, which means that for this particular unit, that particular line item was not required. And we have some red X, which is basically this has not been fulfilled and this has not been done. and they need to go back in there and update and add a picture as a verification process. And um, then we would actually check those as completed. We also did a few um, on-site verifications where we went through the initial AHUs and we demonstrated how to fill in the checklist. We went through, I think, two different AHUs in the beginning and we went through the entire checklist process so that everybody was informed and in tune with how the checkout process was going to be um, coordinated and, and done. And this is actually working quite well. It's great for me as a commissioning engineer to wake up in the morning and to look at the checklist and to find out that actually my contractors and my resident engineer are actually using the checklist in the right and accurate manner. And as adding photographs where necessary or adding additional information or files to make sure that the checkout process is going smoothly. And finally here we have basically any testing and balancing requirements, making sure there's line items for those to ensure that that process is done accurately. And there was also fire testing and alarm processes that we had to also go through. This hasn't been done here at this stage, which is why it's just numbers. There are no ticks or X's or not applicable because um, for this particular AHU, we are still going through the process of checking out these checklists. Um, these checklists are basically done over a period of time. And I'll go through a few pictures in a bit about trying to work in an airport that's 24 hours in operation and there can be no breaks to the um, operation of the um, airport, which means that these installations can only be done after certain parameters or protocols are actually completed. But this is basically the start to finish of an air handling unit pre-functional checklist that I just went through really, really quickly there. All right, um, some photos. All right, the following photos in, the, in these slides, it's a quick review or a quick view of the processes and procedures that were undertaken during the course of the removal, the demo of the AHUs, 
and the installation of the new units, the ductwork and the pipework modifications also as required. So these pictures are the kind of pictures that will be integrated or included on the checklist that I described initially. And at every stage, um, we'll usually ask for either a picture or a notification to state that that particular activity has been completed satisfactory. And these are basically pictures of the staging of uh, the demo of the existing units. The units, as you can see, are very old, pretty obsolete. It's been there, we're running for 20 years. And anyone who knows any units usually have an end of life of between 15 to 25 years. And considering it's a corrosive environment, um, these ones to actually be still functional after 20 years is actually a testament to the facilities management staff for looking after this equipment as best as they could 24-7 um, while um, all of this is going on. Um, so one real quick. All right, so the removal of the existing units, which had to be completed at night and coordinated with land side and air side departments, and that can take a while because you need to get paperwork from this particular department to the other department. And we have to ensure that all the procedures, all the permits, all the, all the safety and security protocols were adhered to. They run a very tight ship at the Aruba airport and they're very, very stringent and very strict in terms of maintaining all the different protocols that are set up. Pictures here basically show the process of removing uh, existing um, early in it, they're put on um, trays and they're kind of loaded off from the plant room through the occupied spaces in some cases, which is why it has to be done at night so there are no passengers around and taken out of the building. Um, so the next slide real quick. Slide 41. All right, so the delivery of the new units, which in this case is happening in the morning and um, based on time allowance, it's basically, uh, these are transported on a truck as shown. Um, they're created in and they are basically transferred based on how those pictures are either on trolleys or cherry pickers, depending on where the plant room locations are. Um, all the technicians are there with their safety equipment and they're basically doing the checkout procedures for some of these equipment during the delivery and the initial installation process in these pictures here. A uh, great bunch of guys to work with and I took some of these pictures while we were there going through the process with them. All right, now this slide here is basically, so the new units have been brought in, they need to be reconnected, they need to be, the, all the components need to be um, confirmed and checked out. Most of this equipment came on a ship through three, three weeks to four weeks of uh, transit or shipping and things could, components could have fallen away or moved around during the um, delivery process. So it's very important to ensure that once the new units are brought in, that the entire cabinets are open, the uh, um, quality check of all the components are still attached as and secured as required, and making sure that all of those um, kind of still work or still basically making sure that everything comes in the right kind of way. Um, Pictures on the side also some of the ductwork prefabrication that actually has to happen. We have our contractor at the bottom picture there, basically isolating some valves and in preparation for the assembly of the new units, which is a pretty problematic process, but um, we all work together um, to kind of make this happen. So obviously, because it's uh, not necessarily a very much plug and play system, some of the new units have different um, heights and widths and um, dense, um, depths as the older units. So there have to be some prefabrication of ductwork. Um, it has to be reconnected. It has to be resealed. Um, basically, any final pipe work connections have to be modified. Um, in the picture on the right hand side, the insulation has not yet been installed. It's just basically as quickly as possible, plug it in, and we'll come back later on during to put the to put the final pipe work, which would not be plastic. It will be um, galvanized steel, and also the insulation thereof, and also any valves or any components that we are not able to include at this moment in time. Um, the ductwork um, pressurization will also occur, but at this stage, that's kind of been phased for later on in the process. The intention was to, because these particular units actually serve the office areas, and the intention is to have these units offline no longer than 12 hours during the nighttime before the temperatures rise up again in Aruba and make it too hot to work in those offices. So it's almost like a 12 hours, demount the units, take out the units, um, bring in the new units, install them, connect the pipework, connect the ductwork as quickly as possible within a 12 hour window. 
So it's a pretty um, substantial um, effort. But um, like we said, we have a very, very good team and they're very good at also doing their verifications, which is why a lot of these pictures that you see here, um, it's pretty awesome. All right, next slide real quick. Uh, final picture that I wanted to show here is basically, um, so the variable speed drives for some of these units, uh, the electrical connections are verified, the hertz or the flow or the speeds of the fans are also verified real quickly just from eyeball and the VFD with the um, fan operation, as well as any final checks, you know, before contractors are required to vacate the plant rooms until the next scheduled installation stage. So the intention is basically to go in, it's going to be a construction mess, finish up within a 12 hour period, take final pictures of what it looks like at that stage. Um, I think the door in the middle picture needs to be closed a little bit more, but things like that we can spot check with pictures like this just to make sure, okay, we can develop issues logs for things that they need to rectify or repair. The picture on the right actually has a bit of insulation on the um, pipe work at the bottom bit, which is actually split. So that would obviously have to be replaced. And pictures like this are really good for documenting the stage of the uh, commissioning and any repairs newly that are created based on some of the observations from the installation. All right. So obviously I talked about the install, the inspection of the final installation, even though it's staged and we still haven't completed the controls packages or the installation packages. Pictures on the right there basically show a lot of stakeholders, um, a lot of people involved, making sure that everything is kind of the way it should be. Um, stakeholders include the O&M teams, it includes the project management teams, it includes the contractors, it includes some of their subcontractors, BMS vendor, commissioning agents such as us also. We're taking some quick snapshots of the installation for, I think this is a, one of the first um, AHUs that we did and we're kind of doing a lessons learned, things that we need to change for the subsequent installations and things that we, uh, that worked really, really well for this particular installation. So, um, like I said, everybody is involved, everybody is working, you know, for the same goal and we're all collaborating together to ensure that these phased installations of the existing systems goes smoothly and does not interrupt the daily um, operation of the airport. Of course, in the meantime, you know, existing units <laughs> to be replaced or, or inspected have to kind of be reviewed and any current problems that are identified need to be kind of basically um, notified and logged also. And an issues log is created with assignees notified to make any scheduled repairs as soon as possible. So 24 hour of functional um, airport, there can be no disruption to the day-to-day -day operations of the airport. So the picture on the right-hand side is we opened an air handling unit and we found that there was a blockage in the chill, in the in the, <clears throat> the cooling coil. And we basically were flooded with very cool water in the summertime in Aruba, which is actually quite pleasant. And we kind of had to isolate um, connections real quickly and kind of figure out where the um, um, leakage came from and any corrosion that might have occurred though. Um, units obviously above ground, this is actually on the roof. Um, anyone who's been to Aruba, it's a pretty corrosive marine environment with salt and uh, there's a lot of corrosion that actually happens to pipe or connections or um, any nuts and bolts or screws or even any different interactions with any metal elements there can cause all kinds of damage that you can see in the pictures. Picture at the bottom right, obviously, is the uh, facilities management staff um, isolating valves and making their quick re repairs to the units in as quickly as possible to ensure that there's no disruption to um, operation. The pictures on the left of the picture is basically a field observation report that we created from one of the initial AHUs that was installed. Obviously, this is a temporary pipe work. You can see condensation on the floor, condensation through entire, um, even from the fabric of the ASU, it was sweating, quote unquote, and we had to basically notify the owner very quickly that these units that you procured right now would need to have the right supply of temperatures kind of programmed to them, even if it's a hand programming at that time to ensure that this condensation does not become a bigger issue that will create potential rust and damage to the units later on. So that was a very, very um, 
lovely exercise to actually be able to do. And I took those pictures there and I posted them and sent them to the clients. So they rectified that issue and sent me some updated pictures with insulation installed and no more condensation on the units, which is great. All right, let's talk real quickly about the building management system. But before we do that, the rendering here is also just part of the airport. I like to use this as breaks, just in terms of what the architects are kind of pro proposing of what they've proposed in terms of design and um, interior package for what the airport is going to look like. So if anyone goes to Aruba in the next three or four years, just know that you've seen these pictures beforehand and Kelly shared them with you. All right. For here, for the BMS, we also reviewed OPR. We reviewed the bill of quantities. We reviewed the tender documentation for the solicitation of the controls and monitoring requirements. Uh, picture obviously in the middle is the bill of quantities that the uh, designer provided for the BMS. And the document on the right hand side is the tender documentation which Bauman was actually engaged with AAA to actually go out. It's an island, it's not a lot of providers over there. Make sure that we have a a nice pool of potential providers, especially with backnet enabled type of systems that will have like open protocols that anyone can use without having them be so proprietary. And we basically helped um, find uh, local vendors and also vendors that were in neighboring region, um, such as in Panama or in Venice, uh, not in Venezuela, sorry, in Colombia or in parts of Central America, like in Mexico, that, that would tender on this particular project. We created an evaluation matrix of um, the tender submissions, and we provided our recommendations to the uh, client, and the client was able to have um, scheduled telephone and in-person interviews with some of the final bidders, and in the end, we helped select the winning bidder for this particular project, which was uh, um, Integ right now. And I'm working with them, and we're having a great relationship with them at this time. Um, um, we also reviewed any testing and commissioning requirements for the BMS. This was included in the tender documentation. We had to make sure that it did with whatever protocols that we thought would be necessary for the BMS contractor once they were selected. We included that. We also reviewed any control schematics of the issues to ensure that all data points, temperature, pressure, airflows, component statuses were included also in the documentation, including any sequence of operations, making sure that these were in a in accordance to the design requirements. So the picture on the right obviously shows an airstream controls um, schematic of an air handling unit um, from the outdoor air side to the return air side to the um, cooling coils to the fan, to all the different temperature pressure, um, flow rate sensors, supplier temperatures, etc. And it, we already talked about the document in the middle, which is basically the testing and commissioning requirements for the BMS. Now, obviously, once you hire a, a, a BMS contractor, they will provide you with uh, submittals, technical submittals of what they're proposing based on the um, design documentation that they received or the tenant documentation. So we basically had to review the uh, system architecture that they were proposing, which is a modification, slight modification from what the designer proposed, and which we had to evaluate against the design intent and actually what was being proposed to make sure that any discrepancies were kind of like um, called out real quickly, put into the issues logs, any IP addresses or any um, data points that were supposed to be provided were also included and reviewed by us to make sure that the design and the submittals actually matched or merged and wherever there were discrepancies, everyone knew about them and we had a contingency planning for those moving forward. All right, for this slide, basically later in the process, so we've gone through the submitter reviews, we've had the contractors on site, they've started putting their control points and monitoring points, and in the back end, they're also preparing the graphics package that would be used for the, um, the, the BMS. So in this particular slide here, we have, um, basically the, we have to re review the system tree arrangements. We coordinate this with AAA, Aruba Airport Authority facility staff on usage and framework of how they intend to navigate the graphic interface. Issues like color coding and alarm mode, normal operation, fire mode, offline for any other reason were addressed. What color is this going to be if it's in the state? How do we make sure that the colors kind of align? How are the colors intuitive so that people can basically look at this very quickly and bing, they have a light bulb moment in their head and they say, okay, that's where the problem is. And they can go over quickly. Um, so the building interface here will show red on any equipment on the alarm mode. And uh, this is the first graphic that will be shown on the BMS once you log in. 
And the sidebar is obviously for navigation. It will be active at all times, and you can basically navigate through all the different um, um, equipment and pages of the graphic interface using this particular platform. For this here, we, we basically, this shows navigation possibilities. Um, so obviously we went from an isometric layout to a, from an isometric view to a layout format. We have the ability to zoom in and quickly of any out of system or problem units. We remember that there are over 160 VAV units and over 23 to 27 aliens across the entire projects. The reason I say 23 to 27 is because in some cases we had to change during the final design, beginning of construction, and maybe separate um, one AHU into two because of space reasons, or combine two aliens into one because of um, operational reasons or changes in um, the the architecture stage. So that's why occasion where we just keep track of okay now it's through the process, but it was very very engaging. Um, next slide here is things like room layouts, things like um, equipment nomenclature was also coordinated for the existing equipment and new, existing equipment and also new equipment as they came online. So that's a nice view. It has different, um, it has an AHU overview with supply temperature and VFD frequency. It has different spaces with temperature overview and color indication of temperature. It has an air indicator so you can go through the different flows of the airport using this navigation toggle, which is actually pretty clever. Here we have basically a BMS graphic interface for an AHU with outdoor air damper, return air motorized dampers, filter pressure indicators, cooling coils, fan statuses, variable frequency drive position indicators, as well as any outside temperature indicators, zone temperatures, and any other room indicators that you might have here. We reviewed the proposed animations as indicators to determine best fit for purpose. In some cases, you want the animation to rotate or move or change position. In some cases, you just want a color to be kind of, a color comes on or a color comes off, which shows whether it's on or off. And things like this, we had to discuss with AAA facilities management staff. They were involved in the entire process and recommendations in terms of maybe what they've done in previous airports was provided. Um, the contractor we're working with actually worked on the airport in Panama also, so they came with a lot of experience. And we provided, you know, navigation links for rel relevant information for that particular equipment, where you can just click on that and it takes you to the next kind of sub page for that equipment. So this is a typical AHU. This is for a typical VAV box. Um, what's shown here, basically, so bear with me real quickly. Yep. So it's a variable air volume equipment. So we have damper position on the graphics. We have animations there which, you know, if the damper is going to open or close, how much is it open, how much is it close, et cetera, but then half full, half empty, as well as supply a temperature from any respective AHUs. AHUs feed these VAV boxes. VAV boxes, basically, I think somewhere between eight to 12 for each air handling unit. In some cases, I think it might be more than 12 though, but and some new VAVs are being added to the AHU capacity. So things to track, um, but things that the VAV would show us is, you know, anything to do with the um, space temperature, zone, occupancy statuses, quick information on hot and cold zones very, very quickly, which this particular page here would show you. So basically this is for AHU G2.2, and this has, or this actually has a lot of VAVs attached to it. And in real time, the gaps that you see under the VAVs are for the VAVs that haven't come online yet. And it shows basically any um, space temperature occupancy status of the different VAV boxes. It shows um, links to relevant VAV groups. It shows uh, associated AHU names, so you can always track back which if an AHU, if a VAV has a problem, what's the AHU that's feeding it. And if you click on all those boxes, the VAVs basically come up as a pop-up and you can, you know, interrogate or kind of look at them in a little bit more detail to make sure that you understand any issues that those VAVs are actually having. And finally, we evaluated the training capabilities of the VMS to track any operational patterns and alarms generated if required. So we can track the supply temperature against return temperature, for instance, to check, you know, against uh, room conditions. We can check zone temperature against um, supply temperature. Or we can also track um, um, AHU temperature against VAV final temperature, et cetera. Things like that can all be tracked here. I think the picture here basically shows that act actuators, um, Supplier temperature pressure, temperature quality of um, 
kind of um, outdoor air temperature, CO2, for instance, any alarms that were generated can all be tracked through trend logs. That was very, very good. All right, last set of slides promised, okay? I'm almost done. Um, so obviously very important to ensure that the appropriate and the relevant training for the OM and for the OM staff at different stakeholders is provided in a formalized way during the handover process. Um, I think we see a lot of projects where um, the training and the operations manual is kind of handed in at the end of the project and there's kind of like a gap sometimes between when the facilities team actually come online and when the contractors actually finish their setup and do their completion of um, um, their certificate of occupancy or their completion um, statement and hand these over and sometimes there's a gap between facilities management guys coming in and thinking, oh my God, why are they doing it this way? Why haven't they done it this way? Where's all the information? Why have they designed it in that direction? So something that we wanted to track here was making sure that as this particular um, airport comes online, that the facility staff are in tune and don't have any um, things that happen that they were not expecting. So basically, this is the first time the airport is going to have a BMS system, and there will be a gradual shift in systems capacities and controls and monitoring capabilities. It involves a very personal and coordinated approach to make sure that the O&M staff were involved during all aspects of transition to the BMS. So the pictures here are basically what's existed, what we have, where, what the BMS guys have to connect to in terms of what is kept and also what will be ripped out. We have to go through the entire facility, do a couple of walkthroughs, take a lot of pictures, understand exactly what the existing systems were, understand any final controls issues that they were having and make sure that these were addressed as the new systems actually came online. And obviously to, you know, to ensure that we basically ensure during the tendering process that we had a training manual outline for the commission systems, including any associated systems manuals for the new systems that will be coming online, making sure that these and this particular training structure or the systems manual and what was going to be included in them was actually communicated early during the tendering process. So there were no um, surprises later on and making sure also that the um, O&M staff actually saw these documents in real time, I mean, early in the stage so that they could ask for any modifications that they wanted or any changes that they would like. Because they have basically have to run this system for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So making sure that all the documents that you see there were actually provided and these are documents that can be interchanged and can be updated as accordingly or as we find new issues. Um, I believe that would be my last slide. Um, I want to thank everybody for your time and your patience as I went through all the material and I'm looking forward to any questions that you guys might have. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Thanks, Kelly. We do have a bunch of questions, so we'll see how many we can get through with the time allotted. The awesome. first one is, does this airport operate 24-7? I've had problems with trying to schedule shelter in place testing for 24 seven operation. Yes, this airport actually obviously it's an, it's, it operates 24 seven, but since the question was asking about shelter in place, obviously because of COVID-19, um, the airport actually had to shut down flight operations in terms of people coming in or flying out, but it's still, an, it's still basically a quintessential administrative office with a lot of, um, administrative issues that still have to be addressed. So it's running as an office right now. And I believe in the next couple of weeks, the airport air sites um, areas will actually go back online. I hope that answers the question. The second one is, are there long-term energy goals and strategies for implementation and or monitoring for this project? Yes, very, very good question. We will be implementing a measurement and verification protocol for this particular project. Like I mentioned earlier in one of the slides, um, with the PV, the main utility does not want the um, energy consumption of this new upgrade, new um, increase in the footprint of the airport to consume more electricity than it currently does at this moment in time. So we will be helping them track that process through measurement and verification protocols. Okay, the next question is, how much time was spent on this project for just the commissioning effort? That's a very, very good question. Um, so obviously the gateway project is between four to five years um, in, in its entirety. So in terms of time and effort, we're talking about easily three to 4,000 hours of commissioning activities value is planned just for the gateway, for the existing facilities, for the BMS, for the 
M and V for the the um, energy center, and there's also a guard center or a guard tower coming in. To we're talking about potentially close upwards of four to five thousand man hours, commissioner. Next question is: Did you witness test all the equipment or just the sampling? Um, when is it for the for the centralized equipment, such as those chillers and the cooling towers? That is a hundred percent sampling that will be done, which means we witness every single one of those bits of equipment. For the terminal units, VAV boxes and fan power boxes, we're looking at potentially between twenty-five to thirty-five percent sampling rates is what we will be looking at individual um, on our own to verify functionality. Okay, thank you. Next question. What standards were the contractors used to working with? Okay, Any? So, were they... Go ahead. I'm sorry, the end of the question was, um, were the specifications written around ASHRAE? Um, no. So um, Aruba is kind of like a Dutch, it's not Dutch owned, I don't want to upset anybody, but it's very, very Dutch influenced um, island as part of the Netherlands Antilles. So the, 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 the Netherlands has its own standards for uh, testing. It's not based on ASHRAE, it's based on the Dutch standards and it has similarities to what we will call pre-functional and functional performance testing. They have factory acceptance tests, they have site acceptance, acceptance tests, they have site integration tests, and they also have total site acceptance tests also, which uh, there's a lot of synergies between the ASHRAE standards and also the Dutch standards, but they're not the same. Okay, next question. What commissioning web-based software platform was used for this project? Um, we are using CX Alloy. Great. For the replacement of AHUs in 12 hours, were they fully tested? The example, functional performance test completed with controls, et cetera, in that period of time before the new air handlers were put into service or were the tests deferred until later? Most of the tests were deferred until later. In that 12-hour window that they have, they basically have to demo a unit, isolate the valves and the ductwork, bring in and um, take the unit out, bring in a new, a new unit, plug very quickly um, whatever fabrication they can do to the pipework and the um, ductwork, and also the power connections to it. And that's then staged, and the function performance testing, and parts and the um, implementation of maybe the uh, permanent pipework would be deferred to a later date. Okay, we have two more questions to get through. Have you been recommending chilled water coil control valve positions for resetting chiller water set points? We have been coordinating with the different stakeholders on chilled water set points. So we've not necessarily been recommending setbacks or setback temperatures or any of that stuff, but we have been involved in the coordination process for, especially because the energy center came online and then the new chillers were installed there and then the existing chillers were turned off from the existing building and these existing chillers were actually relocated physically to the energy center, which is at least a, a mile, I mean, uh, one kilometer distance. And those are now brought in online also. So we were part of the coordination process, but we did not um, direct on changing of temperatures or set points of those temperatures. Okay, and I just have one more question for you. What are some of the BMS controls, takeaways, and lessons learned? Start early. Start as early as you can. Do not think about the BMS as an add-on that you want to kind of put in later on. And also, your clients sometimes might have um, aspirations of what kind of BMSs they would like to have with all the bells and whistles. You need to do an evaluation of your current facilities management processes and make an evaluation of how high of a step you think you can go and make sure that that is included in the OPR for the BMS so that they don't get a lot of things that they don't end up using in the end. Okay, thank you so much, Kelly. That was the last question that we had for you. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. I just wanna close things out by thanking the presenter one more time and everyone else who, enjoyed, who joined us today, including our members across all three organizations. Please keep an eye out for an email for information regarding your learning units from the CX Energy app. While you're in the app, we'll also be asking you to, to uh, evaluate this presentation. We hope to see you again next week.
for the next webinar in the series titled Signal to Noise Ratio. Can you hear, see me now? Taking place at June 4th at 2 p.m. this same time next week. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.